Welcome back to another episode of Special Education Advocacy with Ashley Barlow. I'm Ashley Barlow, and I'm so happy you are here. Friends, I am out of town, and I am, actually, I'm not out of town, but I just got back to town, and I am recording this before I left town. And as I was thinking about, like, what is something I can present on right before I leave town in a quick podcast where... I might already have something together that is super helpful during IEP season. I thought, well, it's easy for me to talk about all the time, and I don't need notes, and I don't need a whole lot of uh, research is inclusion. And so something that we've never addressed on the podcast, and I can't believe that we haven't, is some of my more practical advocacy strategies for inclusion. So we are going to run through some of those now with hopes that I get you enough information that you can go out onto the internet or into your books or into, you know, my club tools if you're in the club or elsewhere to to empower yourself before your annual meetings, if your annual meetings fall in the spring or, you know, regardless of where you are in your IEP cycle to empower you with more inclusion strategies. I do truly believe that these are things that need to be worked on throughout the year every year. And so I never think it is too early or too late to start working on these strategies. Heck, even if you've graduated, we are still advocating for inclusive environment, um, probably more. Uh, So ready, set, go. That's what I always say. The first thing I want to talk about is some really good communication. So you've heard me preach about the parent interest statement and the future planning statement Those, if they are still on the website, they will not be there long because we are going to move those to be exclusively available to my monthly membership people because I revamped them. So I have revamped them and they are now in the the new IEP binder that is available in the club. If you don't know about the club quickly, it is my monthly membership. And this year I am finally building a really nice. I'm calling it an IEP binder, but it is a series of guides and checklists and and a ton of communication templates and other templates to help you get organized with your IEP paperwork. So one of the things in there is this future planning statement or parent interest statement template. I think that's a super important thing. And I'm not going to go through what the document is, but I want to tell you why I think it's important in the context of inclusion. So parents don't have, or pardon me, teachers, educators don't have crystal balls and they are to educate. The purpose of the law idea is to educate students for the, the, uh, their future employment, independent living, oh, I'm sorry, future education, employment, and independent living. And so if we think about what the purpose of the entire law is, it's super duper future forward, right? We're talking about their future education, their future employment, and their future independent living. Those are some big things. Well, obviously, parents are going to be very involved in that for most children that are on IEPs or for a lot of children that are on IEPs. And so it's super important for parents, regardless of their kid's age, even if their kid is in kindergarten, to say these are our hopes and dreams for our kid in the future. This is what we plan for in adult life, in high school, in middle school, now. This is what we're concerned about. This is what we're doing. This is how we're approaching these different things. This is how we're doing all these therapies. So that the parents and the teachers and the school staff are on the same page. So I think that's a super practical strategy. Maybe they don't know that your future has this super duper strong inclusion component to it. So that's number one. You have to communicate it. Number two is to be extremely honest about where you start and where you stop. Like in in negotiation, we call this bracketing, where we say, hey, listen, here's where I am comfortable. Obviously, you don't say this to the other person. So, you know, you would say to a mediator, like, you know, if I'm buying a car, I am comfortable at twenty to twenty-two thousand dollars. If they will, if their bottom line is twenty-three thousand, then we've got this thousand dollars where we don't overlap, and so I'm going to walk away. Well, you can do that to a school district. You can say like, "Hey, 
I am only comfortable going this far and then I want to stop and vice versa, where it really becomes important in inclusion is to say, listen, I am not expecting that my child is going to learn trigonometry in the eighth grade or that my child is going to take calculus BC advanced or AP as a senior. However, I do expect that my child has these opportunities and gets this exposure and continues to learn. And, and, you know, then you go into all of the other details of the inclusion, you know, of, of the benefits of inclusion, right? And in the inclusion workshop, which is available for sale on the website, this is, feels more like a commercial at this point. But in the inclusion workshop, we go on some of the benefits that the law, the regulations and the case law says that we have to look at things like harmful effects on the child, um, harmful effects on the gen ed peers, which, by the way, are there's not any research to support harmful effects. The research either says flat effect or improved effect on both the child with the IEP and the child that is not disabled. But we also have to talk about benefits to the child and benefits to the gen ed peers. And we do talk about those in the IEP workshop, or I'm sorry, the inclusion workshop. So I think, you know, kind of bracketing and saying like, I'm not saying that like, you know, we want to be, you know, a rocket scientist. However, this is what we're looking for. And you kind of go through that list. And that list is going to be different for you than it is for everybody else. So that's number two. The next thing I want to talk about is I want to talk about scheduling. So a lot of times, and I've talked to so many clients and so many friends about this recently, that I thought I need to do a podcast and talk about scheduling. So especially for elementary schoolers, this is way easier for middle schoolers and high schoolers because you just pick classes like do you want to be like my choice, for example, is Jack is included in middle school and he goes to all four core content classes for gen ed. And one of the reasons is with Jack's behavior and anxiety, he does very well in structure and he does very well where other students are learning and he's learning also in electives. Things are usually a little bit more loosey goosey and the behavior management might be different and things might change on a day to day basis. And that's not as easy for him. And so that's the way that we've done it. We've done inclusion for four, con four core content classes. He goes to an elective as well. And then he goes to special education for two class periods. And I am always happy to share that information because it's not right for everybody. It's not right for um, anybody but Jack Barlow. But the, I'm, I'm happy to share how we came to that decision because I think that's what's important is you know, kind of knowing why somebody does what they do. Okay, so, but in elementary school, what I like to do is I like to say to the teacher, hey, what's your typical day look like? And in almost every school, they have the same day. Now, you know, some schools have block schedules and whatever, and so you might have to look at, like, what's an A day and a B day look like or something like that. But for the most part, you can say to a fourth grade teacher, okay, what's in the, what's, what happens when they get there at eight o'clock and what happens at 1215, you know, that kind of thing. So then what I like to look at for a child who's, you know, who, who needs some either pull out resource time or who doesn't have collaboration in their classroom, like co-teaching or something, I like to say, okay, so when is the child super engaged? Like, what are the great times for the child to be in the classroom? And then you kind of look at, all right, well, what is the specially designed instruction? And in order to implement that with fidelity, how much time do we need? And so like, let's see in this gen ed schedule where it might be appropriate to do pull out services. And so we look here and we look there and we look here and we look there and we look around and we see in the schedule if there are places where we can do that pull out time. We also probably first went to look at, if I would look at my own thing, I would have said first, that we would we went to look to see if we can provide specially designed instruction in the actual gen ed classroom in an organic way. You know, resource teachers can push in. So can we bring a special education teacher into the classroom in an organic way? And then we kind of like, of course, now's when you dance. <laughs> so 
you know, I always say we rob math in order to pay reading in our family. We will take some time in the schedule to focus on reading for Jack and leave math alone for a second. And that's just what works for Jack, right? Sometimes we have to work, always, we have to work around really complicated whole school schedules and the specials schedule and things like lunch and recess, which can't be done. And I always say, man, if you want to empathize with a um, school, what you need to go look at is their master calendar, like the program of what teacher is doing what at what time and like who's on the playground and who is in the cafeteria and then where the specials are and when the whole third grade can plan together. And oh my gosh, it is nutty. And so obviously we've got to work around the whole school schedule as well. And so basically we just continue to do that dance until we reach the point that we say, okay, this is going to be enough time for specially designed instruction and enough time in the general education classroom. And this is kind of the perfect situation. It is absolutely appropriate for parents to get that hands on. And it is a super, super good inclusion strategy to get that hands on. In the inclusion workshop, I, I walk you through lots more. So if this is kind of your cup of tea, that might be a good resource for you. We have talked about inclusion a lot here on the podcast, but that was something that we hadn't talked about, which surprised me. And so I thought I would go through it with you quickly today. Next week, I think we're back up to business as usual with normal length podcast. And I think I might even have a guest scheduled. I don't have it up in front of me, but stay tuned next week. I will see you then. Same time, same place. Have a great week.